The Echo Chamber, brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers. This Echo Chamber episode is brought to you by the W2O Group, which is making the world a healthier place through marketing and communications. And it's What to Know podcast on digital marketing and communications. Welcome to the Echo Chamber. I'm Arthi Shaw. I'll be your host for today's episode. On today's show, we have Aaron Strout, who is CMO at the W2O Group. And today's show is all about Provoke 19. And Aaron and I are basically going to download the, the three day conference that was held from October 21st to October 23rd at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. It was, of course, the eighth global PR summit that we have put on. It's hard to believe. We will include links in the show notes of all of the sessions that Aaron and I reference. So if there's something that really piques your interest and you want to go deeper, there'll be a full write-up to do that. So with that, let's get started. Welcome to the Echo Chamber, Aaron. Happy to be here. So you and I have just had a really long week. We are both back on the West Coast in in, in the Bay Area. We live, um, we live, we both of us live in the East Bay. And um, we have both spent the week at Provoke in Washington, D.C., um, and, and, and Aaron, actually, you fit a, you, you, you went to New York as well, somehow. <laughs> yeah, this October, as many people know, is a crazy month, and everybody seems to want to squeeze their events in, and so we did an analytics summit the day after the two days of Provoke, so it's been a busy week. Yes, indeed, indeed. So we're, we, um, we will try to be as coherent as possible, since we're both probably a little jet-lagged, um, but we will, I, you know, we wanted to do this while we're still fresh in our heads. Um, just doing a debrief on Provoke this year because there was a lot of interesting topics and and I don't know if we each want to sort of give like a kind of a top line in terms of what we took away. Um, I, I I'm happy to I'm happy to I'm happy to go. Yeah, why don't you jump in and, and I'd love to give my two cents afterward as well. So what I found was I found that 2017 and 2018 were very much about brands looking outward, about purpose, about you know you know how do we want to communicate and connect with our consumers. And this year in 2019, it was brands looking inward. It was really reflective. And it was asking these questions about how can people bring themselves, bring their true selves to work? How can we make sure that people feel empowered um, to be their authentic selves at work? And how can we have empathy? How do we create a work culture around empathy? Um, So to me, this year was really the year of sort of brands looking inward, um, which to me was you know, refreshing change after sort of two years of, and I think 2018 was sort of all purpose all the time. Um, this year, it feels there was almost this pause in this reflection. Yeah, I felt the same way. And I actually, I think I mentioned to you afterward that um, the quality this year, I felt like there were fewer superstars, but really good, solid conversation uh, and good quality people across the board. And one of the things that I just want to call out, because I know we'll touch on a few of the different sessions, but I thought it was um, it was News Whip's session, and I'm trying to remember which one it was exactly. I'm looking for the title here. But I thought the thing that um, was so telling was the gentleman from News Whip who uh, popped up this visual, and he said, I want to give you uh, an analogy or an analog for sort of how things have evolved. And, and I'm giving this as sort of a overarching uh, metaphor for the conference. He said, 10 years ago, if you're advertising orange juice, you have a juice box and it says, this is juice and you know this is like what it's about. And then he sort of did an overlay. He's like, and then today, you know, he pointed out all these things, the CEO, like what's the equity and employee versus CEO pay? Is it, you know, uh, non GMO? Uh, there's a plastic straw, the box itself is coated with plastic. And so, you know, not necessarily disposable and went through all of the different social issues that you have to take into account. And I felt like that was one of the things that I love, both from an internal, and then there was also that panel that talked about nationalism and what role did that play in the, the overall um, impact. So I felt like this was a little more unvarnished in terms of brands talking honestly and authentically about both the things internally, the culture, but also some of the external forces that were pushing against them. One last little uh, piece was the interview with the former CEO of uh, IKEA, right? That one was fascinating as well, where he talked about the fact that they have a wind farm and that all the different thought process that went in when you have such a global brand that could leave such a potential uh, impactful footprint, negative and positive, on the earth. 
and just how how thoughtful they had been and how thoughtful he was in terms of like being a purpose driven brand. Yeah, I mean, and IKEA had so much. I mean, I mean, they were doing this long before it was filling the agenda at every conference, right? At every communications PR conference. Um, so they they came from a real place of credibility. But I like what you said about unvarnished. It was like it was like Provoke twenty nineteen was it was the year things got real, <laughs> like yeah. right? And um and and just so to give the the listeners some context, the the person you're referring to from Newswhip is Paul Quigley, yes. who's the co-founder and CEO of Newswhip. And yeah, the session was um, how will prediction change PR? And it was a great right. visual. In fact, we actually have the visual on our site, so I will link it in the show notes so that you all can see exactly what Aaron was talking about, but it is quite amusing. Um, so what, so overall you feel like this, things were much more real this year and brands sort of were willing to kind of put a little, show their skin a little bit more than they were in years past around sort of what, what it's like to operate in this current environment. Um, what about, so one thing that I noticed a lot was this idea of empathy came up a lot and I know, I mean, there was some, you know, one, one of the agencies, um, MMC, they even um, announced a, a research project around the empathy index on right, stage. Right. Um, I think for Douglas Rushkoff, um, I think empathy was a big part of the way that we engage with technology and what is missing yep. with our engagement with technology. Um, and, you know, and even, you know, you even think about, um, we had the, the president from, or sorry, the CEO of um, the uh, Agami group, and they are behind some of P&G's most powerful campaigns, including the talk, which was about just for anyone who doesn't know, you know, for most parents, when you think about, I need to have the talk with my children, you think about, you know, the the talking about sex, but for black parents, it is preparing their children for the first time that they are going to encounter racial bias in this world and how that really came from a place of empathy that PNG went inward and asked their employees what keeps them up at night. And that's sort of where that came from. And PNG of course had tremendous, you know, they had, permission to play in this space because they had done, I think for 10 years before that, the My Black is Beautiful because black girls were not, and black women were not seeing themselves portrayed in in the media. So I don't know, I I thought some of the most powerful moments came from this true, this true place of empathy where you're really looking to connect with people in a genuine way. And I think what came up again is like, ask the people that work at your organization, what what is keeping them up at night? What do they go home and worry about? Um, and and I think that was, of course, reflected in several um, of the sessions, including Aaron, yours, when, you know, even um, Samantha, is it, was it Gold, Gold, Goldman? Goldman. Yep. Samantha Goldman from Lyft had said that, you know, one of their, one of their two core values, one is, I believe, get it done. Yep. Make and it this, happen. Make it happen. Which is on W2O's <laughs> yes. as well. Yep. Um, make it happen. And the second one was be yourself. And you know, and, and I, well, I'm about to think about something else, Aaron, and we can go there, but I, I'm going to pause actually. So, so I can, you can kind of talk a little bit about kind of how empathy spoke to you at provoke. Yeah. So, um, there were a couple of things that I really liked. So one was, uh, one of the true highlights of the event was listening to some of the women from March for our lives. And we did do a sit down and do a podcast. And I think you recorded the audio from that. So a little bit of foreshadowing there. Um, Delaney Carr, who was Tar, Tar, Tar. sorry, Delaney Tar. Um, she she really sort of hit the nail on the head and talked about during their hundred, um, you know, city tour across all these states that they had a lot of hatred and a lot of vitriol directed to them, which is kind of crazy thinking of what these poor students went through from Parkland. But the fact that they understood it and they had that EQ to be able to say, I get that you know, not, we're not everyone's cup of tea. And I know that people see us as a threat. And it was really interesting too, because I had this conversation with uh, a few of the folks that, um, from precision that helped moderate it, Stephanie moderated it. And then Eric was actually sitting on the podcast. And that was that, um, they really wanted to make sure that this was not seen as gun control. It was gun violence prevention, which I think is words matter that nuance was really important. So that was one of them. And then the other one that I really loved is uh, Maeve Duvalley, oh, who was from yes. Goldman Sachs. Yes. Uh, Maeve is a transgender woman. And I was actually really blown away, especially having come out of the financial services world, You know, knowing Goldman Sachs. Maeve talked about the whole process and actually how much support and empathy there was at Goldman Sachs. So you know, kudos to her for sharing that story and kudos to Goldman Sachs for really being a supportive culture because I totally, 
on that panel, which was what if employees could consistently bring their authentic selves to work, I thought, wow, this is totally set up for they're going to hate on her and this is going to be a nightmare. And it was quite the opposite. Oh, I mean, that was one of those where I think everyone was sort of moved to tears, really. I mean, that was such, there were so many beautiful stories that were told on stage. I mean, it was um, obviously, the, you know, Mom DeValey, who you mentioned, I think Brett Miller from P&G. Um, who, you know, PNG wasn't always, you know, this is the second time we're re- referencing them on this podcast, but they were not always um, this really progressive brand. And, um, you know, and it kind of he, him sharing his story and getting an email right from a from a coworker telling him that he didn't think he belonged there. And, um, and you know, and that and that raised the question that Paul Holmes actually asked in the Q&A is like, what if your authentic self is a racist bigot and I Paul and I talked about this later and I said well you know what if you and this is this is what this is my belief and and I will say Paul you know agreed with me on this if you are an organization that says we welcome clans people for instance you will end up with just clans people right I mean any person of color will will I mean it's like you have wolves there you're not gonna you know the sheep are not gonna show up right and and I think that's why or I mean I do think organizations do have to make a choice I mean and you can you know I mean if you are if you are overtly telling your coworkers that you don't believe they should exist, then you are. I mean, that's violence. I mean, you're bringing violence into the workplace, right? It's like emotional violence. So, um, so I so anyway, I thought that was an interesting question. And and when I talked to Paul about it later, he was like, no, he's like, I knew that answer before I, before I asked the question. He's like, but I wanted to hear it articulated, and I was satisfied with the answer that that he got from the panelists. Um, and then the other, I think Catherine um, Hernandez Blades from Affleck was also on that panel and she talked about the moments in her career when she was told very overtly that she didn't belong in the room because she wasn't a man. And, and all the way down to you don't have a penis. You don't have a penis, and right. And we're not yeah. trying to be crass, but she yeah. literally said that. And I thought that was yeah. incredibly powerful. Really was. And she is such a, a smart and eloquent and thoughtful person. I've seen her speak at other uh, events. And she talked about, you know, growing up in a male dominated industry, again, financial services, Aflac. And the fact that she's uh, of um, Latino heritage and she's a woman growing up in the South and the fact that she wasn't welcome in a lot of different ways for that reason. And, you know, kudos to her for not only transcending that, but also really being strong and and empathetic. And I do want to add one more thing, not that this is all about P&G, but I do feel like they have become such a purpose driven brand. And Brent from P&G did mention something that I thought was a really cool little vignette. He said that they have a uh, chief diversity and inclusion officer, I believe, is either in London or he met with her in London. And someone came up after the talk that she had just given and said, you know, I hate what you stand for. And I'm paraphrasing here. But the lesson was the the DNI, the chief DNI officer said, you know what? Thank you for at least coming up and engaging me. And I think that's the thing is that. We need to get more of this discourse out into the public. So back to the, you know, the white supremacist stuff. It's bad that it exists. It's bad that I think it's been this undercurrent. It's bad that it's rearing its head. But I think one of the things people need to know without getting overly political is that, you know, fingers crossed, and I will not pretend that I don't feel this way, that Trump is not in office. And this is not a political thing. It's I just don't like him and his ways. But the some of the problems that have been created in society, and I think this goes back to the conference, they're not going away once he goes away. There is this frustration that underlies us. And I know that the only thing that is going to get us there is that empathy and that understanding and that willingness to talk and listen to us and to bring it home. The women from March for Our, for Our Lives really understand that better than anyone. And they're like 15, through 18, <laughs> right. 20 years old. It's crazy. So I, and I think that that is an important point. And I think this was actually said on the panel um, that we're talking about with um, with PNG and Affleck um, and Goldman Sachs, that change starts with conversation and how important that is. And, and you know, in the in the case that that Brent Miller said, you know, where the where the DNI officer was like, OK, I'm glad that you were, you know, that you felt that you could tell me this now let's let's talk about it and i think that is a healthy great way to sort of be inclusive um, of you know all points of view i think you know then there was the example that brent gave when somebody emailed him and told him he couldn't exist you know that it's harder to have a conversation when someone's starting from that place but if somebody's starting from a place where like i am frustrated i don't understand what you're doing in fact i may be it's making me uncomfortable and i don't like it but i mean that's a great place to start in having a conversation and i commend organizations for doing that um, yeah, I, I think he gave, he gave two really great examples, you know, one of, it's hard to have a conversation from, from, from the place where he got that email telling him that he shouldn't exist versus someone saying, look, I'm not comfortable. I'm, I don't, 
I don't know. And I'm sure that, I mean, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that person wasn't exactly sure why DNI made them feel so icky and they probably had some ideas, but they, they probably needed to talk about it. And they maybe felt like something was being taken from them and they needed some reassurance that, look, DNI does not come at your expense. Um, and, and I do think that those conversations absolutely have to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I will just to, to pile on to that. There was a session that came afterward and it was called Welcome to Acceptance Street how MasterCard is leading the way on inclusion. It was with Mike Doyle of Ketchum and then Jim Isaacson from MasterCard. And I will say, and I shouldn't have had this, but I, it was two you know, white guys, although um, I think uh, Mike said that he's a, openly a, gay. an openly gay mm-hmm. uh, man, uh, that they had this delightful conversation. And I was not aware of some of the things that MasterCard was doing. And so one, they've created this sort of movement called Acceptance Street. And they have all of the different... I guess ways of identifying. I don't know right, what the right terminology is, and I don't want to butcher that. But you know, it's why the LGBTQ sort of keeps building is that being gay or you know a lesbian isn't like the only designation. There are all different sort of nuances to that, and it's really important to get those distinctions right. But I thought the other thing that I really liked that they did is they are rolling out this product called True Name. And one of the issues that financial services, again, that I come from, places like Facebook that are trying to keep people authentic in doing so sometimes put people at risk because if you were born Arthi Shaw and you've trans, you know, uh, transitioned to Arthur Shaw and you have Arthi Shaw, I mean, Arthi's probably <laughs> right? a little, well, it's little more, less It's more known, ambiguous. But, so is Aaron actually. True. <laughs> yeah. But like, let's say, yeah. you know, it's John and I yeah. transition mm-hmm. to, yeah. you know, Joanne, mm-hmm. but I have John on my card. Either A, it looks like I stole it mm-hmm. or B, it's like, why does that not match? And then people start to do mental math. And they showed a video and a lot of the the transgendered folks there were talking about the fact that it made them feel not just uncomfortable, but in some cases put them in dangerous or like really scary situations. So back to this whole empathy of brands, you know, not only internally from the people, but I think just having that conscious of having a um, social, you know, corporate social responsibility campaign isn't a like, let's put this nice thing out there. It's living that in your culture and really making it meaningful. And, and, you know, that actually made me think that I'm sure, because, I mean, that's a problem that I don't think many people outside of the community really knew existed, right? And and that was, and they probably learned about that from having conversations, right? And I think that was probably the most consistent thing with the most effective campaigns that were talked about, you know, whether it was um, My Black is Beautiful, whether it was the talk, whether, you know, it was, it was MasterCard's acceptance, um, you know, the, the True Names program. Yeah, I mean these these all came from really like they were solving real problems, right? That and they were they were they addressed. I mean, Mastercard solved the pro- was helping to solve the problem, but in the case of P and G, I mean they were just helping to acknowledge the fact that this problem existed to a wider. You know, it was great because you know the black community could see that reflected in P and G's you know messages, but it also educated the you know the non black population that this is happening, right? And that, that that you know it was poignant to hear that to think about the fact that you're having to having to have these conversations with kids as young as probably seven or eight or nine. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so speaking of children and, and, and you've mentioned this a few times now, and I do want to talk a little bit about the March for our lives. Um, well, the, the two um, sort of keynotes that we ended each day on, on Tuesday, we ended with Dr. Michael Lomax, who is the president and CEO of the United Negro college fund. And then Wednesday we ended the day with um, March for our lives. Um, three, three of the founders or, leadership of March for Our Lives. I believe two of them are co-founders. Delaney and uh, Lauren, Lauren are Hawk. co-founders yep. and Ariel is a board member. Yeah, Ariel is a board member. So well, well, let's talk a little bit about them because, um, oh my goodness, I mean, the, the sophistication and the passion of this generation. In fact, Aaron, when you and I were talking earlier, it was like, you know, it almost seems to me that if the millennials were if they're sort of driving this sort of purpose movement that's happening with brands, because I think millennials have this idealism of like, let's go change the world. Based on what I saw on stage, and I think this is rightfully so, Gen Z is the pissed off generation and they are just like, they don't want incremental change. They are like, this has gone on far too long. Um, And I thought that um, all three of the March for Our Lives leaders emphasized how much distrust they have towards they would call it grownups or adults and how they feel like they've been failed by grownups and adults. Yeah, I, I mean, it was. I had the luxury, thanks to you all, of sitting down with them afterward and talking with them, as I had alluded to before. And first of all, I was just blown away. I have three kids who are 20, 17, and 12 who are lovely and they're doing amazing things in and of themselves. But I'm thinking, you know, one, these this group, because it wasn't just these three women, but they got 50,000 kids to sign up to vote 
in the midterms, which is historically a really tough time to do it. They did this whole sort of country tour and went out and talked. The thing that I thought was really powerful, and again, I'm showing my signs, and I am not anti-gun by any stretch. Um, grew up with you know families of hunters and all that, but they were able to defeat, I think it was 47 candidates that were yeah. NRA-backed. Mm -hmm. And I feel like... While I am not anti-guns, NRA has not done us any favors, and I don't think many people would strongly disagree, even if you love the NRA, that you know sometimes when you have these special interest groups, these PACs that are controlling left or right, it's, it's not a healthy environment. And so the fact that they were truly putting their money where their mouth was, but back to your point, too, about the not trusting adults, um, we did have an interesting dialogue, and a little bit of this happened on stage, of this is a group that realizes that they have developed a power block. They had sat down recently with the nine, uh, nine of the Democratic presidential candidates and talked to them about their anti, you know, gun or anti uh, gun violence prevention policy. And when does that ever happen? Not like only with uh, Katie Couric of the world, but with this group of young people. And it does demonstrate that people are paying attention to the fact that they've got millions of people on social media and they can rally them. And so they do have this purpose behind them and they're working really hard to make sure that they wield this tool for good, right, and correctly, but they are being cautious of outsiders. And Lauren, you know, from March for, March for Our Lives did mention specifically that the day of the shooting, there was a feeling of the adults failed us. And so they are going forward with a very skeptical attitude toward anybody that's an outsider, particularly adults, because they feel like... You know, they have failed us on a lot of fronts, uh, environment, gun violence, um, global warming. Yeah, all these I mean, even even the economy. Right. I mean, like the, the, the way it's structured now, um, you know, and, and I think that what was so powerful was that instead of just like, you know, no offense to Gen X. Right. But there was this idea that there was this resignation. Right. Of like, well, this is the way I'm Gen X. I can yeah. take the hit for that. <laughs> right. You can take the hit for millennials. So. Yeah. Um, I, I'm somewhere in between, apparently. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm in the lost. You still fit into the tail end of the uh, millennials. Well, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm an old millennial maybe. Um, but you know, but they, they take an action. I mean, what I thought it was really amazing. I mean, they, they turned this moment into a movement. I mean, one month, I think it was like one month and 10 days after like they watched their, you know, their classmates and their friends, and their teachers die. They managed to mass 800,000 people on the steps of Washington, right? The legislation that they've gotten pushed through. I mean, to, you know, to your point about, you know, how many people they've registered to vote and the, the, the forum that they had with the Democratic um, primary candidates. It's really, it, I mean, it, and, and, you know, I, I caution brands because I've, you know, I've heard a lot of brands say, oh, you know, we're. They've, they've moved on to Gen Z. But they they need to be careful on what they're stepping into because this isn't, they, I mean, from what we saw on stage, they are action-oriented. They like to own their voice. I think they all talked about social media. Yep. And how nodding my head and realizing people can't see <laughs> yes. me nodding my head. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they talked about how Twitter gave them a place where they could control the, their voice. And, um, you know, and I think that, you know, brands that are looking to connect to this, to Gen Z, should really pay close attention to what, what these kids are saying um because they're not you know this if, if they they need to be spoken to in a way that i think brands were used to sort of broadcasting and you know while they've said that they've evolved that um i i think that they're i think many brands are going to be unprepared for the kind of engagement that that this generation expects yeah and and just one thing that you mentioned that sort of sparked uh a memory was during the video that you were doing, I think it was Lauren that said, speak to us, not at us. Right? Yeah, that was actually Ariel. Ariel, Ariel. Ariel. Yep. And even in mm -hmm. better, I would say with us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, yep. it's in, in, engaging. One last thing on that, because you mentioned the legislation. They also have this thing called the peace plan. Mm -hmm. And the peace plan, the guts of it are essentially cutting uh, gun violence in half. So this is a startling stat, but 40,000 on average a year in the United States die. This is, by the way, self-inflicted. It's spouse on spouse or family members as well as mass shootings. So it wasn't just, you know, mass shootings or, you know, street violence. But the fact that they have this ambitious plan in the next 10 years to do this and to really, you know, they said, we know it's ambitious, but we don't want to shoot low and then hope for high. It's like, let's shoot high and try to deliver high and, you know, really make this happen. So I was impressed. So this might be a good segue into into talking about Dr. Lomax, but I wanted to say one thing about 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 what you're about you know that forty thousand number includes not just victims of mass shootings, you know I think that was really powerful how the they acknowledged on stage about you know when the March for Our Lives movement started and it was mostly kids you know from Parkland, they realized that they were white 
mostly privileged kids and that gun violence had been hitting other communities in really, you know, for a long, long time. And they didn't want to sort of co-opt this and make this into like, you know, a white upper middle class issue. And that's when they immediately diversified and they, you know, found leadership from the inner city to talk about how gun violence touches them on a day to day basis in some cases, or, you know, the way that it, it affects, you know, women in, or in, women or men in, you know, in um, domestic situations, um, immigrant communities, you know, communities that would be scared to call the police if they're in, if they encounter gun violence. So I thought that was, I thought they, and, and the, the speed at which they recognized that and changed was also right. really impressive. Yeah, no, it truly was. And again, you're, this is a group that's going to continue to do big things. And I think you're going to see more groups like this go forward that are these pissed off, empowered Gen Z that know how to use social media and they're not afraid to back down. I mean, yeah. they're going to just do amazing things. So it's it's a, a good foreshadowing for some very powerful things to come. Yeah, I loved it when Delaney said that um, they just they, they were they just started going to, to Twitter to just start, you know, ranting and venting about what was happening. And they were waking up with um, verification patches. And they didn't even really fully understand what, what that meant. Right. But they they had suddenly, you know, they, they'd sparked a movement. Um, so speaking of DNI, we also had um, Dr. Michael Lomax, who's the president of the United Negro College Fund, on stage and of course you know for those of you that that don't know you know the united negro college fund has put billions upon billions of dollars towards can i, can I actually i want to really drill down because the stats are astounding yeah no they are astounding and i when we did the podcast i made sure i started with this because i said dr lomax you're literally putting good in the yeah. world mm -hmm. so it was 1.5 billion dollars raised under his leadership mm -hmm. 110,000 students have earned college degrees and launched careers and annually, they enable 60,000 students to go to college with UNCF scholarships. So, I mean, think of like, how, like the March for Our Lives, how powerful that is. One of a few things that, that Dr. Lomax was saying is how, you know, power does not seed without struggle. And, and there were just little... There's a Frederick Douglass yes, quote. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah. He used that yeah. as his book, too, as yes. foreshadowing for the yeah. Uh, podcast. Yeah, no, I, 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 I sh should have started it with that but you know but 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 he was really tapping into this and, and and what I liked about it is we drilled deep into what like the the ways in which people of color feel like they don't belong at organizations or the way they're told they don't belong and one one um, thing that stood out to me was he mentioned that he doesn't um, he wouldn't even watch Mad Men and because, you know, why would he, you know, I think he said, it, I, I could read you the quote, it pissed me off just to see it because I grew up in a time when who was in charge didn't look like us, but they just assumed they had access to our pocketbook and our decisions. And it, it the reason that that stuck with me is about three or five years ago, somebody from, um, someone from the PR industry, I'm trying to remember if they were PR advertising, they were, they were one of the marketing disciplines, um, an African American man had decided to leave agency. And I asked him why he decided to leave at that point. And he said, there were these madmen viewing parties that they would have every week. And this was, you know, sort of at, you know, the, the peak of the madmen craze. And the agency didn't realize how isolating it was to celebrate and have everybody dress up in these costumes and, you know, have a throwback moment to this era. And they'd probably bring around a little bar cart that looked like the one on the show. And, um, and how isolating that was for, for not only people of a color, but I also thought about the women in that, those organizations. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I mean, there were a few that broke through like Peggy and others, but for the most part, it really was not a glorious view. I mean, it was a true accurate view, but how women got treated. And that's, that's not something to celebrate. And I can say as an older white male, I'm embarrassed that like we lived through times like that and that we can go back and look at that. And while it was a interesting show to see historically, it's not something where, especially in light of what Dr. Lomax was saying, that we really want to celebrate. Exactly. And, and, and then, you know, and there are, there are really subtle ways, I think, that the industry and I think they're. The, when, when the conversations that I've had, it seems like agency leaders in particular have become much more aware, but like things like ski weeks, right? Or like ski retreats. And I mean, you know, that it's, if that's been a long standing part of your culture, okay, you can keep that there, but realize that skiing is not as common in, in communities of color. And if you're going to have a, a big, you know, retreat around skiing, you might want to, you know, couple that with something that feels more culturally appropriate for some other groups. Um, so, so uh, yeah, there, there were just, I, and I thought, you know, his, his talk was so, was so powerful and he referenced, you know, a lot of sort of, you know, historical things that have happened and, and trends. But, um, but I, but I think to me, the takeaway was, you know, was how the subtle ways in which people are felt like they feeling like they don't belong somewhere. 
Um, well, and I think an important yeah. one from a pragmatic perspective, you asked and I asked as well, was what can we do to change this, right? How can we break down these barriers? And one was he talked about during the interview process to not to, to be uncomfortable. Don't hire people that look or sound or feel like you to go outside of that, which isn't a like, it's not a quota thing. It's a, this is good, by the way, we've seen economically that having a diverse workforce, particularly diverse leadership team leads to better outcomes because you have better diversity of thinking. And that can be men or women, gay or straight, coming from different economic backgrounds, but also different skin colors and different, you know, um, upbringings. And, and really that diversity of thought is something that's truly powerful. And, and Aaron, actually, so building on that, there was something um, when I was on stage with Dr. Lomax that I thought about was a session earlier that day, which we haven't even referenced. And it was about what we get wrong about leadership. And it was, you know, what we think of as a CEO does not is not supported by the data in terms of what is actually an effective CEO. And one of um, and and I want to actually say the name of this author who um, has led this study. So let me just let me just take a moment to to make sure I have her name. Um, Elena Botello. Um, she wrote the book, um, which I believe um, I'll, I'll reference. I'll put a link to to her talk in the show notes so you guys can read more about it. But one of the things that she said was most indicative of a of an effective CEO was quick decision making. And that speed made me think about how that's con that sort of contrasts to this idea that we need to be more thoughtful in our hiring decisions. And it also made me think about how agencies hire often at, like after they need after the need is urgent, right? I mean they 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 win the big client and then they're like, okay, we won the client, now let's go staff the team. So they they revert back to what they know, they revert back to what is comfortable. And it also made me think of how startups do the same thing. When startups are in growth, growth, growth right. mode, in speed mode, they they hire the person that looks like them, the person that they know will fit into the culture right away, and they, there's no there's no ramp up that they have to do. And, and I don't know how to fix this idea that you know that we, we glorify speed and we um, we emphasize that, especially for early stage companies and for professional services. How do you reconcile that with? Yeah, I mean, if you bring someone in who doesn't think exactly like everybody else that's already there, that will take some time to integrate them. Well, this might be a good transition to one other area I'd like to cover, which is more on the business side and the evolution of the C-suite, particularly as CCO and CMO, and talking maybe a little bit about Mark Stuss's panel on measurement. Um, one of the things that Dr. Lomax said to me, which was, as I was asking him this, was looking at me, you're in power, you be the change. And so where I think from a pragmatic perspective that we can do better is it's easy to move quickly if you have a plan and a strategy. So it's spending some time up front, and this is where really good companies and good leaders I think do this is while they have a moment or even if they don't have a moment, they understand that it's better to take a little extra time to make sure that you know where you're going. It's kind of like you know driving out of the gate and, and I remember we did a road rally you know 10 years ago with friends and some of the people like we'd sit down and they'd whip out of there as fast as we could and I said let's actually sit here and we might take 20 minutes we'll be 20 minutes behind but we have a plan as to what we want to do and we came in you know second place out of this a couple of times which was a big deal for newbies but that is something that's critical and I think is you're hiring whether it's a startup whether it's an agency in fast pace sitting down with your head of HR, sitting down with your head of diversity and inclusion, your CEO, whomever it is, and really thinking about how do we be more planful about having more diverse candidates and candidates that don't look like you as the hiring manager. So with that, because I know we don't want to drag on too, too long, I would like to touch on um, one panel that I thought was good, and then there's some very pragmatic advice. So the, the one that I liked was the evolving role of communication leaders in an integrated world. This was led by uh, Michelle Anderson of From, Ogilvy. Yep. And then we had uh, John Taylor of LG Electronics. He's the SVP um, and head of uh, communications, public affairs. Michael Collins, who's a CMO uh, at the CFA Institute. And then Danielle Mann, who is uh, a comms leader in Mobileye, which is part of Intel. And I thought it was a fascinating dialogue. I felt a little bad for Michael Collins, who was the one CMO, because I felt like they were beating up the CMO role a little bit and talking about how functions were moving into other areas and how communications was sort of taking over. I felt like that may have been a little bit of, you know, the people you were talking to and the people that you were speaking, you know, with um, as someone that's a CMO and does feel like there is a change, but it doesn't mean all of the CMO power is going away. I think it's evolving, right? 
Um, and then I would get your thoughts and I would love to jump into the panel that Mark Stu led as well. Yeah. So on, on that one, I think what really stood out to me was when, was when um, Danielle Mann from Mobileye and Intel had said that, you know, the, I have to be careful because I know it was somewhat sensitive on on, what, on the way she said it on stage. But basically, that at Intel, because there isn't as there isn't as much recognition around what what's the difference between marketing and communications. No one really cares who gets what brief. Um, so I thought that was interesting, you know, because that's what we're hearing increasingly. That's what the world we're moving to, right? This 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 agnostic discipline, agnostic world. And the other thing I found interesting about that panel was, and this is a nice segue to Mark Stuce's panel. That was the second time in the two days that somebody called for PR to be measured in terms that make sense to the to, to someone in finance, someone in sales, someone who's thinking about revenue generation on a day-to-day basis and how as an industry we have really, really failed on that front. And and I think so this is like I'm curious to hear your thoughts and I know we probably need to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Um, on Mark Stuce's panel, I mean, do you think that panel was effective in I think the way Mark described it to me beforehand was it was supposed to be an intervention to the industry of like, look, this is real. Let's get these, you know, business leaders because he had a CFO on there, he had a sales leader on there, um, to say to the industry, look, I mean, when I'm looking about allocating budget, what I'm thinking about is what what will I if I cut your budget and communications, will the organization suffer or not? And if it will, you need to make the case to me to show me how. I want to backtrack for a second, then I will speak to that specifically. I did think it was interesting during that panel that was talking about the evolution of communications that. Um, I think it may have been Michelle that mentioned a lot of the soft metrics moving over into the comms world out of marketing. And I thought you're saying this like you think that that's um, it's uh, denuding or, or whatever the CMO or the, the, the marketing suite. But the fact that you just said that I want to move uh, soft metrics over into my organization, look down the road a little bit. And if marketing has been getting beat up because we're supposed to be so measurable, what do you think is going to happen to comms down the road when people are starting to say, okay, let's really talk about what the value you bring beyond just impressions and beyond articles. And that said, I am a huge believer in the power of comms. And, you know, it is, and I think it got brought up a number of times, the CEO, if there are things that go good or bad, one of the first people they have on speed dial is their chief communications officer, right? So I thought that was interesting. And then moving to this panel called Lost in Translation, why there's a proof gap between you and your C-suite. It was a really interesting dialogue. And I did think that that uh, lever of, you know, budget. And if you had to sort of invest in budget or you had to let go of budget, you know, where would you put it? And, you know, Mark's whole thesis is, is that we don't really measure, measure and, and, and are actionable as we could be on that stuff. I think is true. I did love the way you wrapped up. And while I thought the session itself was good, I thought the last 10 minutes was really the most powerful because Mark said, if you have one really sort of powerful piece of advice that someone could act on today, what would it be? And I'm actually going to just take a minute, if you don't mind, because I think it's, you know, it's pretty powerful. So um, we had members on that panel. I'm just going to read them out so you know. So Mark Stews from Proof, Julie Brown's, Brown from Johnson Controls, Michelle Killebrew from PwC New Ventures, Kevin Moriarty from JDA Software, and then Tom uh, Schodorf, um, who's the CRO of Splunk and also sits on a number of boards. And then finally, Chris Talega from Oracle. And so I think... Um, Kevin mentioned that um, his advice was narrow down the three to five metrics for C-suite and make sure whatever you're doing, whether you're comms, marketing, whatever, aligns with those, which is critically important. Tom mentioned that um, what if we stopped doing something, what would that look like, right? And so I thought that was, you know, actually, I, I think that was Julie. Julie that was, was Julie, the one that said actually, I had that yeah. under Tom, but that was Julie as I'm saying that. Um, Tom was talking about the fact that, um, you know, I think the MQLs and really sort of looking at the power of marketing qualified leads. And I know there's a big, you know, sort of battle back and forth with those. Uh, Chris Talego was talking about anytime people wanted to invest, he would ask them three very sort of firm questions. And one of them was like, is this really the best allocation of these funds and what am I going to get out of it? And then lastly, Michelle Killebrew was the fact that, 
you know, she talked about the quality of MQLs as well and making sure sales and marketing sit down and understand what that is and actually can have a handshake on what that is. So I know that was a lot, but I thought that was actually out of the entire event. That was probably one of my three or four takeaways was listening to these marketing and sales leaders talking about that. Oh, I thought that was great. And I mean, Julie's comment was actually our headline for that session. And I, and I loved it. It was have the courage to stop doing what doesn't matter and take those resources towards activities that matter. That was it. That yeah. was it. Thank you. And, yes. and, and it, you know, and I think, but part of the problem right now is there are, so much of our measurement is so fluffy, right? That we just don't really know, right? We don't know what's, what doesn't matter. We have an idea and I think we haven't even, and we have to wrap up now, but you know, the Microsoft um, conversation where, you know, um, where Doug Dawson from Microsoft basically said they stopped, they put a pause on the podcast because they weren't sure he said they weren't particularly measurable, which yeah, is yeah. is an issue, it, it, and we as podcasters right. know that we totally know that there yeah. are soft metrics you can yep. get downloads and you know subscribers and all that, but you don't know how long they've listened and yeah. all that. So I, I thought that was powerful as well. Yeah, and so and, and they they had the courage to say, even though podcasts, as we all know, are are so hot right now, and every everybody seems to have one, they had the courage to say, you know what, let's we don't need to jump on this bandwagon because everybody else is let's reallocate these resources towards something that we know is making an impact. And I think agencies are guilty of this too, right? I mean, they could, they'll just, they'll just throw everything, you know, it's like, it's, not, I think someone said something about, you know, the way you measure yourself is not how busy you are, like how much activity you're doing. It's how much impact you're making. And, and I think that's where the industry needs to move its focus away from, Oh my God, we have, you know, our, we're so busy. Our clients keep throwing all this stuff at us. Well, yeah, but, that stuff needs to ultimately have an impact. Otherwise, you know, what's the point really? Yeah. I mean, that's probably the ultimate takeaway is fewer things better. Yes. Fewer Empath th empathy yes. and understanding and uh, really being purpose driven. Yeah. And, and, and being yourself, right? I mean, and how can brands empower people to be their true selves? Um, well, Aaron, this was a great conversation as always. Yes. And I wish we had another 30 minutes to sit down and talk about this because there's just so much to cover. I, I know. I mean, I think we ambitiously plan to do this in 20 minutes and now we're pushing almost 40. So, um, all right. Well, we will be back in a few weeks with another echo chamber and thank you everyone. Thank you, Aaron, for joining us and thank you for all of you for listening. Thanks, Arthur. You've been listening to the echo chamber. Brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by Marketeers. This Echo Chamber episode is brought to you by the W2O Group, which is making the world a healthier place through marketing and communications. And it's What to Know podcast on digital marketing and communications.